if you get a patient and you have them who, um, sleeping just six hours for one week, this is someone, let's say, who is healthy. At the end of that one week of short sleep, their blood sugar levels are disrupted so significantly that they would be pre-diabetic, that you would diagnose them as being in a state of pre-diabetic. Just from sleep um, deprivation. Just from sleep deprivation. We control all of the factors. Um, you can also speak about sleep loss and uh, the cardiovascular system. And all it takes is one hour of lost sleep because there is a global experiment that's performed on 1.6 billion people across 70 countries twice a year, and it's called daylight savings time. <laughs> yeah. And it turns out that when you look at that data in the spring, when we lose an hour of sleep, we see a subsequent 24% increase in heart attacks as a result. It's just incredible. But in the like... autumn, you know, when we gain an hour of sleep, we see a 21% reduction in heart attacks. So, so the data is there on, on a global the level. The data is, you know, is striking, you know, and you can even think, you know, you speak a lot about, um, you know, the immune system. It's so key for our health. So what do, tell us, what does sleep do for the immune system? So firstly, we can look on both sides of the coin. What happens when we don't get enough sleep? Firstly, we know that people who are sleeping five hours a night are four times more likely to catch a cold than those people who are sleeping eight hours or more. Wow. Striking study, very well controlled study. Um, we also know that it doesn't take one week of you know short sleep deprivation. One night is enough. What we've found is that if you take healthy individuals and then we limit them to just four hours of sleep for one single night, what we see is a 70% drop in critical anti-cancer fighting immune cells called natural killer cells, which are these wonderful sort of immune assassins that, you know, help decrease our, you know, sort of, you know, cancer risk. Yeah. And, and, and help us fight infection and fight you know, infection part of our innate immune system. The, exactly, yeah. part of that critical innate immune response. Flip the 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 sort of the side of the coin, and now what we find is that when you get sleep, there is a change in what we call the autonomic nervous system, which is sort of this automatic part of our nervous system. And that automatic nervous system is split into two branches. One that is sort of like the accelerator pedal that gets us revved up, triggers the fight or flight response. The other is the brake that sort of calms us down. And when we go into deep sleep, we apply that brake to the nervous system and everything quiets down. Heart rate decreases. Deep sleep is the most wonderful form of natural blood pressure medication that you could ever wish for. Yeah. But one of the other things is that we see as that nervous system quiets down, levels of things like cortisol drop down, that stress-related chemical. And it's during that time that the body goes into an immune stimulation mode. And it's where essentially you're going to restock the armament of your immune army so that when you wake up the next day, you can battle and fight infection. What's also fascinating, and I love this data, and this tells you just how critical sleep is to, to a fighting uh, for our health. If you look at people who become infected or you actually infect them in the experimental laboratory, let's say with yeah. sort of a, a cold uh, vaccine, or um, you immediately trigger increased sleepiness and increased amounts of deep sleep. And it turns out that the infection indicates to the immune system that you're under attack and the immune system will actually signal to the sleep system within the brain, we need more sleep. Sleep is the best battle force that we have right now to combat this assault. And so that's why when you're sick, all you tend to want to do is just curl up in bed and go to sleep. The reason is because your body is trying to sleep you well. It's an appropriate response to what's going on, right? Exactly. It, so bodies are pretty clever, right? It, they are remarkably clever. You know, m m again, Mother Nature has figured this out. And so she brings up this thing called sleep, which I would argue is probably like the Swiss army knife of health. You know, whatever ailment you are facing, it is more than likely that sleep has a tool in the box to try and help fight it. That's so key. Whatever ailment you're facing, guys, if you listen to this, whatever you're suffering from, whether it's you know a lack of energy on a day-to-day -day basis, or whether it's that you're worried about your risk of developing a chronic disease such as type 2 diabetes or heart problems as you get older, you know, what Matthew is saying, what Professor Walker is saying is that sleep, improving your quality of sleep is going to help you with all these different facets. It's gonna help reduce your risk, it's gonna help increase your energy, it's also gonna reduce your risk of actually getting 
disease in the future, which is just absolutely incredible. I mean, we are going to move on to um, tips because I know many of you will be thinking, okay, this is all great. You know, I, I'm sort of hearing about all these things that sleep does, but how do I get more? So we're going to we're going to come to that shortly. But so much I want to talk to you about, Matthew. I mean, I think we could easily make this like a, a full day podcast. I, I'm that fascinated in this. <laughs> I would but, love to return at some point, should you wish me to. Yeah, well, 100%. But I think, you know, what you said about... Um, Medical school training, I think, I think it's very important because pretty much everything that I put in here, and then the last quarter of the book is on sleep. I am not convinced that any of that came from my medical school training. So that was all self-taught from, you know, spending hours on PubMed, reading research, going to conferences, trying to learn more because I wanted to help my patients more. And I thought, you know, I need to know more about this so I can actually do my patients, you know, and give them a better service. Um, so you're saying that, you know, maybe medical students uh, may may get maybe uh, two hours or so. And you'd love to sort of try and help that and get, you know, maybe a sleep curriculum into medical schools. And yeah. this really, you know, I think one of the reasons we get on so well is there's so much synergy in our in our viewpoint in terms of how we think this needs to change. So what I've done over the past six months is... Um, is develop a brand new course with a colleague of mine, Dr. Panja, called Prescribing Lifestyle Medicine. And it's a one day masterclass to teach healthcare professionals, but primarily doctors, on the basics of, you know, lifestyle medicine, if you will, as a term. You know, so we go into sleep and we we teach this framework while they can simply apply these these four pillars with their patients to start to actually you know, implement lifestyle medicine. I'd love to, you know, I'd love to maybe collaborate with you and show oh, you the I'd slides. Yeah, and... I'd love to. And, and I've got, you know, I teach a whole course at, uh, at the University of California, Berkeley, the science of sleep. So I've got lots of uh, slides. I'd love to just share and do whatever I could to try and help sort of perpetuate that movement that you've got going. It's wonderful. That's exactly what we need. Yeah. And then maybe we can talk about how we get that into medical schools and, you know. Yeah, I was going to actually ask you, you know, you know, how could we, you know, um, even collectively, you know, think about trying to, you know, approach sort of medicine here in the United Kingdom and see if we yeah. could. Well, we'll talk about that, that off the off air uh, from the absolutely. podcast because I think that good. could be a great collaboration. Um, okay, Matthew, I know you're short on time and again, we could just go on for so long. I was going to ask you about um, sleep and stress, but I think, you know, guys, for those of you listening to this, I cover that in quite a bit of detail, I think, with you on my chat that's on my Facebook page, which is facebook.com forward slash Dr. Chatterjee. Um, so guys, you can actually check it out there. But everything that Matthew and I talk about, including that Lancet paper that he mentioned, is going to be in the show notes, which is going to be at drchatterjee.com forward slash why we sleep there's going to be links there to everything matthew talks about some of matthew's articles his book all kinds of things so guys do check that out after the podcast and you can do a bit of further reading on those topics that interest you um so yeah where to go to next i mean one thing that we do talk about on that course and i think we've not spoken about this yet is about sleep and its role in mental health Mm -hmm. and you know What's interesting, you mentioned bi-directional relationships before and how a lack of sleep can increase our risk of problems, but also sleep can be a treatment as well for various things. And I wonder if you could talk about that in relation to mental health problems such as anxiety and depression, and maybe from there just move briefly on to Alzheimer's if possible. Yeah. So we've done a lot of work in this area of sort of sleep and, and mental health. I think the first point to note is that we have not been able to discover a single psychiatric condition in which sleep is normal. Wow. And I think sleep has a profound story to tell in our understanding, uh, in our treatment, maybe even ultimately at some point our prevention of grave mental illness. And I don't say that flippantly. Firstly, um, we've done some work where you can take healthy individuals and you can deprive them of sleep for a, a single night. And then you place them inside an MRI scanner and you look at how their brain has changed. And what we find is that these deep emotional brain centers erupt when you're sleep deprived. You become a lot more emotionally reactive, impulsive. There's a deep brain center called the amygdala, which is one of the centerpiece regions for the generation of strong emotions. That part of the brain is up to 60% more reactive when you're sleep deprived relative to when you've had a good solid night of sleep. 
And we've also found That's out... That's a huge amount, right? <laughs> it's a 60%. It's very difficult to usually see that type of a change in the brain without some kind of pathology or drug. And I think, sleep I think, deprivation I think will do it. on an intuitive level, most people recognize that when they haven't slept well, you know, they're just a little bit more reacted to things that that email from a boss from their boss for example can be easily misinterpreted you know they annoyed at me they you know you suddenly start to see things that aren't there and i I, i've just i mentioned this before i've I've just completed my second book called the stress solution which is going to come out in january and i cover a little bit of this that you're talking about in that to really try and show people that you know lack of sleep is a stress on our body and 60 percent that's incredible change in the brain yeah and i think it really comes you know you you're absolutely right Many of us have a sense that, you know, I just snapped dot, dot, dot. You know, those are the words that usually follow a you know bad night of sleep or when you've not got enough sleep. And we know it all the way down sort of the, the age chain. You know, you think about a parent holding a child. The child is crying and they look at you and they say, well, they just didn't sleep well last night. As yeah. if there's some universal knowledge that bad sleep the night before equals bad mood and emotional yeah, reactivity course. the next day. And it doesn't stop in infancy or childhood or adolescence. It's true when we are adults as well. And we've seen this data. What I think is concerning is that that neurological signature that we discovered in that uh, study is not dissimilar to numerous psychiatric conditions. And in fact, we're now finding significant links between sleep disruption and depression, anxiety, uh, including uh, um, PTSD, schizophrenia, and most recently and tragically, suicide as well. Um, in fact, a short sleep duration is usually predictive of either suicidal ideation, suicidal thoughts, suicide attempts, and tragically, suicide completion. So I think there are the, sc- the scope uh, through which sleep is impacting mental health disease, I think, is considerable. Um, we used to think in psychiatry that the psychiatric disease was perhaps causing the sleep disruption. I think now we've been forced to change our minds. It's not as though it's completely in the opposite direction. It's not that every psychiatric condition is a sleep disorder. That's not true either. But is it a two-way street? I think that that's probably more tenable. In fact, is it is the dominant flow of traffic perhaps more in one direction than the other? I think that's also reasonable to assume on the basis of the data right now as well. So I think it's, you know, there's clearly an intimate relationship between our mental health and our sleep health. If you enjoyed that clip from my podcast, here's another powerful clip that is really going to help you with your health and happiness. Everybody has to learn how to do this. Your whole life gets better. Learning to control your nervous system will change everything. The foundational practice that I truly believe every person should do every day is